At our last psychedelic shine featuring Dennis McKenna at the Boulder Theater, I gave a presentation on the potential of a radical new psychedelic research proposal on extended state DMT. This was designed by Dr. Andrew Gallimore and Dr. Rick Strassman. Uh, once we got the presentation online, I forwarded the link to Dr. Gallimore to see if he thought I was crazy or not. And apparently he is just as crazy as I am. Uh, when I sent this poster, with the event's poster description to Dr. Strassman, uh, the talking to aliens theme and all, he suggested that maybe I run it by Dr. Gallimore first, just in case we should, you know, minimize that language. And I had to tell Dr. Strassman that this was all Dr. Gallimore's idea. Uh, this is the same Dr. Strassman that wrote DMT, Spirit Molecule, and DMT, and the Soul of Prophecy, and all of that. Uh, and it was synchronistic that Dr. Gallimore is in Boulder this weekend. Uh, he said yes to letting us put on a shine so he could present his ideas. Obviously, this gave, uh, gave us an opportunity to take a further step into manifesting extended state DMT research. Uh, so here we are. And today is uh, what came out of that expedition. So I'm really grateful that you're all here. Uh, we have people who have flown in for this from other parts of the country. And, and again, might be listening internationally, which is great. <laughs> I think Dr. Gallimore can explain what he does a bit better than I can, uh, but he is a computational neurobiologist, pharmacologist, and chemist currently based at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, uh, where he uses computational modeling to study brain function. He has been interested in the neural basis of psychedelic drug action for many years and is the author of a number of articles and research papers on DMT and the psychedelic state. His recent he recently collaborated with DMT pioneer Dr. Rick Strassman, author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule, to develop a pharmacokinetic model of DMT as the basis of a target-controlled intravenous infusion protocol for extended journeys in DMT space. Andrew will give a multimedia presentation on the use of this powerful psychedelic drug as a tool for exploring worlds beyond this reality and for communicating with otherworldly intelligent beings. He will tell us all about his extended state DMT proposal. His website is buildingalienworlds.com. Let's give a big boulder welcome to Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Good evening, everyone. Oh, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm still a bit jet lagged, so um, it's it's evening for me. Um, well, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, really wonderful to be involved. My first time in Colorado. Um, first of all, can everybody see me? More importantly, can everybody see uh, the slide show? Can, do we? Do these lights? Yeah, we need them for the cameras. Okay. As long as everybody can see. Uh, everybody understand my accent? So, anybody here from the UK? Nobody? Okay. Uh, any Irish? Half the room. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so... As, uh, thank you, Daniel, by the way, for inviting me. It's really nice to be here. My first time in Boulder. Um, so, if you are interested in... Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, um, then please do go to my website, buildingalienworlds.com. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with kind of a brief five-minute anecdote to kind of as kind of as a uh, sort of a, a contextual anchor, you know, kind of my, my experience so far in Boulder. But then I will segue pretty seamlessly into the main talk on psychedelics. So if you listen carefully, you might uh, hear the gears change on that. So so I arrived in Boulder on uh, Friday night. Um, I was pretty tired, so I, I, I went straight to bed, and I didn't really get to see the city until uh, Saturday morning. So I, I, I took a walk. And whenever I arrive uh, in a new city, the first thing I do normally is, is buy razors. Um, I'm a prolific consumer of razors, um, and you can tell a lot about a city I find by the, the availability of high quality razors. And say so Boulder is um, <coughs> exemplary in that regard. So I, I walked. It was pretty early morning. I woke up like 6 a.m. because of jet lag. Uh, and I took a stroll along 28th uh, just to the Safeway. Um, and I was, I, I was picking my razors and uh, I, was, I was stood in the, the, the checkout, I guess you call it a cash register, and there was a guy in front of me. And he, he looked a bit uh, bedraggled, I guess, he looked like maybe he had a 
a tough night. Uh, and he, had, he only had two items, and I noticed them specifically. He had a, uh, a single apple and a pen. Right? It was, you know, just a simple, nothing special, just one of those plastic kind of big pens, right? Uh, and a single apple, a green apple, right? Single green apple. I'm not sure if that is relevant, but I'm aiming for kind of full disclosure. <coughs> I want to give you all the information that I have. Um, so I noticed it specifically because I wondered, you know, did he get up this early specifically to get those two items? Or did he kind of browse the store and narrow it down to that, that selection? But anyway, he decided on this pen, this green apple, and he seemed to be struggling with uh, paying for it. Maybe he didn't have much money. But anyway, he, he paid for this pen and this green apple, and I kind of forgot about it. Uh, and I thought he'd left the store, but he hadn't. He'd just kind of gone to the side of me. So as I was paying, uh, the lady was cashing through my, my items, my raisins and such. This lovely little old uh, uh, senior lady uh, came shuffling over, and she, she shouted, and I thought she shouted to me. She said, uh, sir, why are you doing that, sir? Uh, and I thought, what? Uh, but that she was actually talking to the guy over my shoulder. And then she said, sir, why are you pushing that pen through the apple? <laughs> so uh, the guy didn't say anything. He continued. I mean, obviously, he didn't leave the store. So, you know, such was the urgency of this, this procedure. <laughs> um, but then he kind of he kind of slunk away, and the lady said, "Did you see that?" You know, and I said, "You know, I've just arrived in town. I'm not familiar with kind of local customers." <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I said, "You know, is, is everybody going to be like this?" And she said, "No, no, no, no. He's, he's exceptional." But anyway, he slunk away, uh, and and he never did explain to us why he was putting the pen um, through the apple. Uh, so if anyone has any idea of uh, why he was doing that, please see me afterwards. Um, but interestingly, when I saw this kind of bedraggled figure with the apple, it reminded me of the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible. Because, of course, in the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis, uh, the apple is the forbidden fruit. And in a way, psychedelic drugs are kind of the forbidden fruit of our age, aren't they? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you segue between an anecdote and the main topic of the discussion. <laughs> okay, so, DMT. Anybody heard of DMT? Yeah. Okay. So DMT, this remarkable, the simplest of the classic uh, psychedelics, so-called classic psychedelics. So we're talking about psilocybin, we're talking about LSD, we're talking about mescaline. Uh, down metal trip to mean, however, the simplest of these the most widely occurring um, in nature, and yet also the most astonishing. So DMT, rather simple structure, you have this indole decorated with this ethyl group and then this dimethylamine group, don't worry about the details of that. But DMT is an exceptionally simple molecule, but what is not simple is what it does to you. And kind of what I want to do today is Rather than just give you a talk about kind of my work and sort of research and that kind of stuff, uh, is I'd rather you go away not having just learned something, but kind of feeling like you have a deeper understanding of psychedelics and deeper understanding of um, the nature of reality and a deeper understanding of the nature of yourself even. So I'm kind of I'm, I'm setting the bar pretty high, and I might fall a little short, uh, but I will do my best. Uh, I'm told you're a smart crowd. Um, so I'm going on the assumption that you're, 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 you're all pretty smart. So I won't spend too much, too much time talking about what we call the phenomenology of DMT, you know, the effects of DMT. Um, I imagine most of you in this room are familiar with that. Uh, so DMT, we know, has this rapid, ex, uh, extremely intense uh, onset. Uh, Leary described as like being fired out of the barrel of a, an atomic cannon. But it's also very, very brief. Uh, five, ten minutes with a, if you vaporize it, which is by far the most common mode of administration. Uh, but the most interesting part of DMT, uh, in terms of its effects, is this complete replacement of uh, what we call consensus reality, this complete 100% reality switch, where the normal world that we're all used to and familiar with uh, disappears in, in, in an instant and is replaced by a world altogether stranger. Um, often described as having this bizarre hyper technological uh, ambience. Um, but it's not so much where you go with uh, when you smoke DMT, it's who you meet there. And many people, when they smoke DMT, describe experiencing meetings with 
extremely intelligent beings, not of this world, not of this universe. So, when you describe the effects of DMT to people, you can normally place people kind of into two camps. You have the, the believers, if you like, and they will say, well, what DMT does is it allows you to access uh, an alternate universe. It takes you, transports you to uh, a parallel universe, an alternate alien reality. On the other hand, you have the, uh, the non-believers, the skeptics, yes? the rationalists, uh, and they will say, no, 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 no. DMT is merely uh, eliciting a highly complex hallucinations, but we don't really believe that, do we? Um, and, and generally, it's people that have smoked DMT that fall into the first category, because the nature, the uh, reality of the DMT space is uh, undeniable. So it shouldn't surprise you, or maybe it will surprise you, that I'm going to be uh, coming from the first position mainly here. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing the, um, the pros and cons of the alternate reality versus hallucination argument. I'm going to assume that most of you here are pretty open-minded. So the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk for about an hour. Uh, first of all, 50 minutes to an hour, depending on how long it takes me, obviously. Um, and talk about the structure of reality and what DMT actually does. When people say DMT transports you to an alternate universe, what do they actually mean by that? You know, you see, if somebody smokes DMT, they, they remain there in front of you. They don't physically go anywhere. So you might say, well, they go somewhere in their mind. You know, and what does that mean? Are they actually going somewhere? Uh, these are often questions that are very important, but not really dealt with. So I aim today um, to, to go deep. Um, to go deep and look from the ground up, to start with the structure of reality and kind of change the way you think about reality uh, and the structure of the world around you. And that will then enable me later on uh, to show you how DMT and psychedelics in general actually, but DMT specifically, uh, can change your reality. Then in the second half, we'll have a short break of about 10 minutes, as Daniel said, just a comfort break. Uh, and then uh, I will go into talking about some of the more pragmatic, uh, practical stuff with uh, this DMT extended work. So the first half is going to be fairly intense, so you, you will need to concentrate, I'm afraid. Uh, but I will be supplementing my talk with lots of visual imagery, so please take note of the visuals. Okay, so let's start right at the bottom. So, does anybody know what this is? Yes! Wow. This is a cellular automaton. It's a special cellular automaton called the Game of Life. Now, what is a cellular automaton? Well, this was a uh, type of computer grow program invented by a mathematician called John Conway back in the 70s. And as you can see, um, it has a basic structure. It has these grid of uh, square squares called cells in cellular automaton language. And each of these squares can be in one of two states. It can either be white, often referred to as being dead, or it can be uh, colored, or black generally, uh, referred to uh, as being alive. Uh, and you can see lots of these interesting patterns forming across here. And you may be asking, what's this got to do with psychedelics? Uh, you know, where are the drugs? You might be thinking, not for the first time, I imagine, in your life. The drugs are coming, yeah? We just have to get there. Okay, so the cellular automaton, I'll talk you through how this works. And it, it, it seems a little bit abstract and a bit strange to be talking about this, but it will all make sense, hopefully. So the cellular automaton is this, this grid. And as I said, each of the cells of... Uh, this grid can be either in one of two states, alive or dead. Uh, in this case, black is dead, blue is alive. And at each point in time, uh, every cell on this infinite grid will either be in, uh, be in one of these two states. And the way that a cellular automaton program runs is by updating the states of all the cells in parallel at exactly the same time. Everything is happening all together everywhere at once on a cellular automaton, as Alan Watts once said. So the game of life has four basic rules. So we look at a cell here, which I've highlighted, uh, and then we look at the cells, what's known as the cell's neighborhood. 
And that's simply, as you'd expect, the cells that are surrounding the central cell. And what the central cell does is, so in this central cell here, it's, it's in a, the alive state. If a central cell is alive and it has less than two living neighbours, so less than two of these are alive, in this case only one, it will die of loneliness, right? So it becomes black. If, how, on the other hand, it's alive and more than three of its neighbours are alive, it dies of overcrowding, like this. If, however, precisely three of its neighbours are alive, so we've got exactly three neighbours here are alive, then it remains alive. And if a cell is already dead, then it will remain dead unless exactly three, exactly three of its neighbours, doesn't matter which neighbours, but exactly three neighbours uh, are alive, then it will become alive. And these are the uh, four rules that govern the so-called game of life. So every single step of time in this computer program, every single cell will look at its neighbours and basically decide what's my next state. So in a sense, what's happening is the central cell is receiving information from its neighbours. That's a really important concept, this idea of receiving information from its neighbours uh, and deciding what it, uh, will happen. Now, amazingly, when you run this program, it exhibits really quite startling behaviour. So this is, um, you can't see, this is because the, the, the cells are so small, but this is running entirely uh, from these four simple rules. These creatures that appear to be moving are not moving, it's just the cell states are changing and give the appearance of these objects moving. Um, this is even more interesting, we can see these very small objects here, which moving in and then they, they self-organize. This is not programmed, they self-organize and they form these structures, what are known as spaceships, which once they are fully formed, and only once they are fully formed, they then drift away like this. And this is, the game of life is actually actively studied. There are forums on the internet where you can go, where people are discovering new uh, structures in this program. And it's hard to believe, really, when you look at it, that this all arises from these four simple rules. Simple rules often gives rise to great complexity. So if you don't believe me that this is actually just cell states updating, uh, we can look a little bit closer up. So this is something called a, uh, a glider gun or a pair of glider guns because they emit, as they move back and forth, they emit these little creatures here, each made of five cells, called gliders. So here you can see certainly this is simply cells updating. So let's have a look a little bit close, uh, more closely at what's actually going on here. So this is a glider. This is the, f uh, the four states, including the return to the original state, of a glider. In the bottom right here, we can see it moving. We can see it's moving diagonally to the right, the grid moving with it so it stays on the screen there. And what the glider is doing uh, is it's moving between these four states and then it returns to uh, its original state, but it's moved. And so it recycles through this. Now, if you actually... Uh, apply the rules of uh, John Conway's Game of Life to this, as I've described, actually you will see that this is exactly what happens. This isn't made up, this is how it works, so this, uh, this behaviour like this. So, if I was to ask you the question now, what is this glider? What is it? Is it a, an object? You might say, well no, it's not an object, Andrew, because uh, the cells are actually changing. So the cells that make up the glider here are different to the cells that make up the glider here. So it, it can't be an object, because an object has to you know, retain uh, uh, its components. Uh, so then you would say, well, what could we call it then? We could call it a process, I guess. We could say the glider is a process. Uh, but actually, the best way to describe this glider is, a, is as a pattern of information. And we're going to be talking about patterns of information a lot today, because understanding information and patterns of information is essential to understanding psychedelics and certainly for understanding DMT. So I guess the first thing I should do is ask the question, what is information? Um, and it's, everyone has an intuitive understanding of what information is. And if I asked everyone in this room what information was, I'd probably get seven, eight, nine, perhaps more different uh, uh, answers to that question. So I'm going to give a very precise definition of information. Um, and it will seem a bit abstract at first, so don't worry about that. Uh, so information is generated when a system selects between a finite number of distinct states. Now that sounds very strange, um, but has anyone ever flipped a coin? 
Ridiculous question, of course. But here I have a 25 cent coin, yeah? You'd have thought there'd be a shorter name for it. But anyway, so this 25 cent coin, I'm going to flip it, call it? Tails, OK. Tails, OK. So if I asked you now, so you don't know what it is. Uh, I know whether it's heads or tails. Uh, but I could ask the question, how much information would you gain by me telling you whether it's heads or tails? Anyone know the answer to that question? Well, I'll tell you. It's actually tails. Well done. You can buy me a beer. <laughs> but the answer is that um, whenever you have a choice between two states, in this case, case the coin can only exist in two states, we ignore the landing on its sides. Forget about that one. Yeah, uh, either heads or tails. So it's a two-state system. And when you select between two states, you gain a very important amount of information known as the bit. And we're all familiar with bits, or we should be, uh, from computers, of course. Um, but let's have a slightly more complicated example. Um, so it doesn't have to be coins, of course. It can be anything that can exist in two states. And it's actually the bit is regarded as perhaps the most fundamental unit of information. And you can build highly complex information just from bits. And of course, we all know this. We know that the computer that I'm running now is using, at its core, it's using bits. It's using two states, sequences of bits to encode extremely complex information. So let's look at another example to really cement this idea uh, into your mind. So let's imagine a more complex system. Let's say we've got a 64-state system. Um, which I will represent as a 64 square grid, because that's a pretty straightforward, simple visual way to understand that. Uh, and so by selecting one of these grid, we basically put this system into one of the 64 states. And the question now is, if you didn't know, let's say we chose this square here. So this is one out of a possible 64 states. How much information would you gain by learning the state of the system? out of one out of 64. So let's try and work this out. Um, so for example, if I had chosen the square and not told you, and you wanted to find out, and you could ask me questions, you could just say, OK, where is it? Which state is it in? But that wouldn't be uh, particularly instructive. Uh, but how about we use this method? So what we're going to do is we're going to split the system into halves, and we're going to use a series of yes, no questions. So the top and left here, this will become clear what I mean by this. This is to do the algorithm we're going to use to get the answer. So we split it into two halves, and we ask a simple question. Is it in the left half? The answer is, of course, yes. yes. Good. So we can get rid of the right half. So then we split it in halves again, and we say, is it in the top half? Yes. Great. So we can forget about that half. We split it in half again. Is it in the left half? No. no. Great, so we can get rid of the left half, split it in half again. Is it in the top half? No, we can get rid of that. Split it in half again, you get the idea now. Is it in the left? Yes, it is. Um, split it in half again, is it in the top? Yes, that's the one, and we found it. So this is actually the most efficient way of uh, finding uh, an object on a uniform grid. And you'll notice that as I was bring this down, uh, doing this, I was placing uh, digits on the bottom of the screen. These were basically the answers to the yes, no questions. So one for yes, zero for no. So yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes. This is six bits of information. So now you know that a 64 state system encodes six bits of information. Or in other words, you can represent this rather complex system. Imagine a 64 sided die, quite complex, right? But you can represent it. Uh, as a sequence of bits. Does that make sense? I haven't lost anyone yet. Great. So now we can look at this with fresh eyes. So now we understand that information is generated when a system is selecting between a certain number of well-defined uh, discrete states. So in, each, in the game of life, is this cellular automaton? We've got just two, two states. And so this is clearly a pattern of information. The, uh, the glider or this uh, is, is basically selecting, the cells are selecting states uh, as they go along. And so this is clearly just a pattern of information. So 
Whilst the glider is a very simple pattern of information, as we've seen before, the game of life can often give rise to very complex patterns of information. And often uh, what happens in the game of life is you will see very simple patterns of information. I call them critters, uh, just for simplicity, will often join together to form larger, more complex patterns of information. So here uh, we've got these little, little beasties, these little critters which are joined together to form uh, more complex structures. So sometimes we uh, refer to these simplest structures that are just made of a few cells as first order structures and then they form these higher order structures, second order, and these can join third order. And all the, all the time as you're getting more and more uh, of these structures joining together, uh, you get this hierarchy of complexity and it gets more and more complex. And sometimes it becomes so complex uh, that you lose sight of the fact that you're dealing with this simple pattern of information because it's a highly complex pattern of information, but this is running entirely um, uh, using the four simple rules of Conway's game of life. Pretty amazing stuff. Okay, so let's uh, look in a little bit more detail then uh, at these patterns of information. So let's revisit this glider gun in close up. So then let's uh, zoom out and we can see we've got actually two glider guns and they are emitting these gliders in opposite directions and when the gliders meet they annihilate each other. What's actually happening is that you've got patterns of information coming in both directions and when two patterns of information meet each other they modify each other, they affect each other. So information is processed. So one pattern of information can interact with another pattern of information and change that pattern of information. So this, I'm not suggesting, of course, that the game of life is really living at all. But it is a really um, nice way of viewing the world. Um, and this view of the world, actually, the idea that ultimately everything can be explained, no matter how complex it is in terms of information processing, and I'll give some more examples for, kind of from the familiar world in a second, uh, can be probably traced back primarily to an eminent theoretical physicist called John Wheeler, uh, who said every particle, every field of force, even the space-time continuum itself, derives its function, its meaning, its very existence entirely from the apparatus elicited answers to yes or no questions, binary choices, bits. Everything is information processing at its core, at the ground of reality. Um, so this way of looking at reality uh, matured into a branch of physics still relatively new and still relatively niche uh, called digital physics, digital philosophy. And Ed Fredkin, the computer scientist, apologies for all the words on here, uh, but he says something quite neat here. He says, if we could look into a tiny region of space with a magic microscope so that we could see what was there at the bottom of the scale of length, imagine the grids of cells uh, in Conway's Game of Life. We would find something like a seething bed of random appearing activity. Space would be divided into cells, and at each instance of time, each cell would be in one of a few states. A snapshot would reveal patterns of two or three or four or some other small integer kinds of distinguishable states. In the Conway's Game of Life, of course, it was simple two states. It would either be pluses and minuses, blacks and whites, seven shades of grey, ups and downs, or whatever. The point is that it would be equivalent to digits. So what Ed Fredkin is suggesting here is that the ground of reality, we have a discrete, uh, perhaps a digital system um, where, of simple rules interacting to create increasing layers of complexity. Now, anyone who's studied biology will be familiar with this idea of hierarchies of complexity. So right at the base of reality, we have the fundamental, uh, the grid, if you want to call it that. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a cubic grid or it, the, the actual structure is unclear, but it would be a discrete grid-like structure or perhaps a network-like structure that operated according to a few very, very simple rules, basically information processing at the, the, the ground. Then these, um, perhaps through several layers of uh, complexity that we don't yet understand, you get the emergence of fundamental particles, you know, the electrons, the quarks, the Higgs, yeah? 
Um, but these, of course, are simply patterns of information in the same way that these uh, lower order structures are patterns of information. Uh, and the fundamental particles then form patterns of fundamental particles that we know as atoms. Atoms form patterns of atoms we call molecules. And under certain circumstances, large numbers of molecules form extremely complex patterns that we call cells. And the cells form tissues. Tissues form organs. And right at the pinnacle, right at the apex, possibly, possibly not, uh, is the organism because we sit at the apex. And in the same way that in John Conway's Game of Life, when, when, this, when the structures you see become extremely complex, you lose sight of the grid. And indeed, whilst the ground of reality is pure information processing, we lose sight of that fact because it's way, way down, deeper, 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 and down. So from the base of reality, we get increasing complexity all the way to brains, conscious uh, creatures like ourselves. So... To put it succinctly, everything is a manifestation of the complexification of information. So let me give you a, another quick example from the real world. This is a network inside a uh, neuron in the brain. Don't worry about what these are at all. Well, they're just molecules. Uh, we know that molecules, of course, are patterns of atoms all the way down. So molecules are simply patterns of information. And these uh, patterns of information interact with each other uh, to form, uh, to, uh, to, uh, through which complex functions emerge. Um, this is the network of molecules inside a complete cell. Again, don't worry about the details, they're not important, but you can see it is inordinately complex. And of course, a cell is a complex beast, and it requires this complexity in order to be living. But actually, when you look at it deeply, you can see it's just a very complex network of molecules that are interacting. It's a complex network of patterns of information that are interacting with each other in the same way that the gliders, when they met each other, interacted, except, of course, in the gliders' case, they simply annihilated each other, but often uh, with highly complex patterns of information, uh, you get much more complex behavior. So again, to put it simply, where there is information, there is life. And this applies not only to this world, but to any other world. So let's bring this a little bit closer then to, um, to psychedelics. So let me give you another illustrative example, again, from the game of life. So we've got a, quite a complex structure here in the center. Imagine it's more complex than it is actually there. Uh, this is just for illustration, and you have four simple moving structures. You can see a couple of gliders moving towards it. Now, if this is sufficiently complex, when this glider interacts, reaches this structure, uh, and interacts with it, basically this complex structure is receiving information about what's going on up here. It's receiving a pattern information which, if it's complex enough, it might be able to actually interpret in some way. And it might be able to say something like, oh, there's a glider gun over there. So in a way, this structure is, is, is exhibiting a, a simple form of perception. So we all know what perception is. We're all familiar with the idea of light, photons uh, hitting your, your retina, these being converted in, into information in the brain, or, or patterns of... Uh, sound waves entering your ears. But of course, we now know with our new updated 21st century view of reality that light uh, itself, these photons, are simply patterns of information. So really, your perception is not so different to this. The patterns of information in the form of light photons, for example, are entering uh, this complex pattern of information, which is your brain. And your brain is perhaps... Uh, certainly the most complex, or arguably the most complex pattern of information in this universe that we're aware of, probably not though, uh, certainly not the most complex pattern of information in the kind of worlds uh, that people often visit the height of a DMT trip. But your brain, all the same, despite again being at the apex of this hierarchy of complexity, is itself a pattern of information. And what your brain really is, is not only a pattern of information, but an information generator. Your brain generates information. 
And not only does it generate information, but it also receives information. This is perception, right? This is receiving the patterns of information from the environment, receiving light, uh, sound, uh, warmth, touch, all these kind of things. And what's interesting about brains, of course, is that they are, or well, they seem to be conscious. Uh, and that's, I'm not going to go too deeply into consciousness, simply because it's such a thorny and difficult issue to grasp. Uh, but I'm not ignoring it, uh, I am ignoring it deliberately, I'm not, I'm not kind of neglecting it. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. Perhaps afterwards, if someone wants to talk about consciousness, they can do so. I have a few ideas, but um, I simply don't have the time here. Uh, so your brain is a generator of information. Remember, when, whenever the cell states of these structures are updating, they're generating information. So your brain is a very complex uh, generator of information. Indeed, most of the, the information is actually generated much higher level in the, or, uh, the complexity hierarchy at the level of neurons, and we'll talk about those shortly. But what's special about the brain is that this information manifests as your world. Your world is built from the information generated by your brain. It's a really important idea. The information generated by your brain feels like your world when viewed from the inside. We're viewing patterns of information on the screen here, but when you look around uh, your world, you will see that it is, it is extremely informationally rich. There are, is a, a myriad of forms, of textures, of distance relationships, of colors, of sounds, of smells, all of these things. These are all information, they're all information generated by your brain. And this applies under all circumstances, whether you're in the normal kind of waking world state, whether you are dreaming, or whether you are at the peak of a uh, intense breakthrough DMT trip, the world that you experience is always information generated from your, by your brain, but viewed from a subjective perspective. Um, Max Tegmark uh, used this kind of wonderfully, um, Max Tegmark is a theoretical physicist that's had some ideas about consciousness, a wonderfully kind of vague uh, and yet pithy statement. We said that I have long contended that consciousness is the way information feels when being processed in certain complex ways. Um, so there are a number of scientists that are looking at you know, what is it about the complexity of the information generated by a brain uh, that gives it a, a subjective viewpoint. And that's something we're not going to deal with. But your brain is always generating information. And when you are conscious, that information is always your world. So that's the kind of uh, the important point here. But this isn't just any old information, is it? So for some reason, the information generated by your brain has something to do with what's going on uh, outside. Um, it's useful information. If you're out hiking in the Rocky Mountains, right? Yeah, contextual. Yeah? Um, and you see a bear, for example, how you respond to that, you know, that bear is in your head. Now, people often distinguish between the real and the non-real by saying, oh, it's all in your head. Yeah? But actually, it's always all in your head. <laughs> Always. So the perception, the experience of the bear is indeed information generated by your brain. But it has something to do with what's going on out there. And if you, the way that you respond to that information may determine whether your information is terminated or not. <laughs> so what the brain is doing is although your world is built from this information generated by your brain, it's also receiving information from outside of the brain, if you like. I'm hesitant to use these ideas about the external world or the real world or the environment, because I think that I can very, very quickly trip myself up. But if you imagine one of these structures in Conway's Game of Life, there's everything that's outside the grid, if you like. So everything that's outside this brain, we will call um, the, um, the external world, the environment, or whatever you want to call it. And the brain is receiving this all the time. So it's receiving information. Um, but it needs to learn how to make sense of that information. Um, so to kind of get you to understand how this works, you know, why the information generated by your brain is so useful uh, and enables you to kind of navigate um, this reality, 
We'll separate the information into two. So we'll split it. We'll talk, we'll talk about the information generated entirely by the brain, which is your world, always. Uh, and then we'll talk about the information being generated by everything that's going on outside of your brain. Uh, then we'll simplify it even further by separating this information as being uh, all your brain information, all the information generated by your brain is within this circle, and all the information generated by in the external world is this circle. And your brain is a product of evolution like everything else, everything else living. Uh, and as your brain evolves, it is constantly receiving information from the environment. And eventually, the brain starts to produce information that tells you something about the environment. Let me explain what I mean that, by that. As you can see here, as we go, progress of neural evolution over millions of years, these circles begin to overlap, and then they overlap even more. And they overlap, and this overlapping region, anyone do, do Venn diagrams at school? Right, yeah, you said, oh, I'm never going to use them. Yeah, here we go. So, mutual information. So, mutual information is the information we know about one thing by knowing something about the other. So, for example, if I showed you a photograph of an identical twin, by looking at the, the, the photo of this identical twin, you automatically know something about the other identical twin that you've never seen. You know, perhaps the shape of her nose, the color of her eyes, perhaps the shape of her face. Um, even better, if I gave you the DNA sequence, the genetic code of this single identical twin, you automatically know the genetic code of the other identical twin without having to ever take her DNA because they share what's called inf uh, mutual information, information that's shared by two different things. So what this is saying is that as the brain evolves, this complex information generator evolves, it starts producing information that actually tells you something about the environment. And that's really important that a brain can do that. Uh, otherwise, you're living in a world um, that might be very beautiful, uh, but it's not an adaptive world. It's not a functional world. It's not a useful world. And evolution would strike that down. So let's move away from these grids for a little bit uh, and actually start to think about the brain itself. Uh, try to understand how this works. I've spoken a lot about the brain as this information generator, that this information is your world. So let's think now a little bit more deeply about how does the brain generate information. So this is a slightly more realistic uh, vision of the brain. Uh, we have uh, all this stuff inside. This is kind of a slice, this is a coronal slice, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, and you've got these two halves of the brain, then you've got this outer layer of the brain, which is the cortex. Your cere cerebral cortex is this uh, very thin, it's only a few millimeters thick, flat structure like a sheet, uh, but it's, it's actually quite large, maybe about this size, uh, but it's tightly folded up so it can fit inside your tiny skull. Uh, and all of the world building uh, information generation, well, not all of it, but much of it uh, is uh, generated by this outer layer, the cortex. And the cortex of your brain is built uh, from a number of different types of cells, many different types of cells, in fact, uh, but mainly the most important one, which anyone who's studied any kind of biology up to kind of high school level will at least be vaguely familiar with, and that is the neuron. Wonderful. Thank you. So the neuron is the information processing, information generating uh, unit of your brain, the smallest unit. Again, this idea of information. Uh, and the neuron, don't worry about details. Not going to be too many technical terms in this talk. I'll try and avoid it. Uh, so the dendrites feed into the cell body. The dendrites receive information from other neurons. The cell body receives this information and basically processes this information in a very basic way. Uh, and then it sends the processed information along this single uh, structure called the axon, uh, which the, that information can then be passed to uh, other neurons. That's all you need to know. Uh, now, all of these neurons in your brain are connected together to form uh, very, very, very complex networks. But importantly, in the cortex, um, about 120 of these neurons form this complex ne network uh, called a cortical column. And a cortical column, uh, we actually see it a bit better here. This is actually a, uh, uh, a reconstruction of a microscope image, very, very high resolution microscopy. You can see all these neurons here, uh, and they form these kind of cylinders. And here I've tried to represent it. These cylinders, you can see from the top here, um, 
and they, they, there are a number of layers in these cylinders. And, and these columns are the uh, computational units of information generation in the brain. Uh, so that, so, so a, a single neuron can only generate very, very simple information. Uh, but when they join to form these columns, they generate more, much more complex information. So if you were to look at your cortex from like a bird's eye view, you would see uh, this kind of structure. All of these columns, all of these cylinders stacked sideways uh, to form this kind of pattern. <coughs> now, these cortical columns can either be active or they can be inactive. That's a massive oversimplification. It's not as simple as that at all. But let's just keep it simple and imagine that cortical columns can either be active or inactive. So we've got active columns here in yellow, inactive columns in gray. And of course, this is a pattern of activation. It's a pattern of information. So this is a pattern of information generated by the cortical columns. And in your brain, you have perhaps uh, two to 400, uh, two to 400 million. Two to 400 million of these cortical columns all packed together uh, like this. Um, so it's the activation of specific cortical columns that gives this pattern of information. And believe it or not, it's this pattern of information generated by these cortical columns that is your world, but viewed from the subjective perspective. Uh, you'll also notice that these columns uh, are not, uh, they seem to be connected, but not kind of uniformly or randomly. They're connected in a very specific way. And this connectivity is really, really important. It allows columns to speak to each other. It also means uh, that the, the, the types of patterns of information, the types of patterns of activation of these, these cortical columns can be kind of sculpted by the patterns of connectivity. So for example, if this yellow one in the center here uh, is activated, uh, it means it's more likely to activate the columns to which it's connected. Whereas a cortical column that's not connected to uh, hardly any other cortical columns is much less likely to receive information that causes it to be activated. So, so what the, the brain does, as we'll see, uh, uh, during kind of neuroevolution, is it, it, it tweaks and changes and modifies these, these patterns of connectivity, which modifies the patterns of information. So let's make this a little bit more concrete. So let's imagine you want to uh, build a very simple world using a brain uh, perhaps this cute little face. A simple world, just has this face, uh, and he's moving kind of left to right in your field of vision. Um, so let's think then how we might generate the information to build this very simple world. Well, we need to think about what kind of information do we need to encode uh, by the brain? Well, uh, we need to encode the shape, we need to encode these little these circles, we need to encode perhaps uh, the colors, of the eyes and the skin, the texture. We need to encode the movement. All of these things need to be encoded, and they're all encoded uh, by information generated by these patterns of cortical columns. So let's try and make this even clearer, hopefully. So this is a uh, just 16 cortical columns. When I'm doing kind of explanations of how this works, I normally use this 4x4 four four, uh, column grid to kind of um, illustrate my points, but of course in reality we're talking about millions and millions of columns. So in the brain there are specific regions, specific sets of columns that are uh, given the, the, the role of generating motion information. There are regions that are uh, given the role of generating color information, regions for texture information, regions for form uh, broadly. So the outlines of objects, straight lines, curves, the overall shape of objects. And so we can see here that we've activated specific columns in the specific regions to generate a pattern of activation. And that pattern of, of activation is that, going back, is that experienced from the subjective perspective. So this alien face is represented by the information generated by this pattern of information generated by this pattern of cortical column activation. Anyone completely lost yet? So we're getting closer and closer now to the drugs. <coughs> okay. You'll see them when they arrive. So, um, so one thing that I mentioned when I introduced these columns is this idea of uh, the importance of connectivity. Uh, and this connectivity is, 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 is a 
extremely important to appreciate because it's the connectivity, as I said, that determines the patterns of information that the brain naturally will adopt. Uh, we call the information, by the way, generated by the brain that is your will, we call it the intrinsic activity of the brain, the internal activity. Uh, but that shouldn't be too important that you remember that word. Uh, okay, so connectivity determines uh, intrinsic information. Connectivity determines the patterns of information generated by uh, the brain. Um, so now we can start to think about, before I showed you that image of neuroevolution, the brain kind of learning um, to generate informa useful information about the world, now we can actually understand how this works uh, in a much more concrete neurobiological uh, sense. So imagine a very early brain, uh, lots of these columns generating quite, quite random activity, uh, but all the time receiving sensory information, all this information, patterns of information from the environment, uh, and that is basically activating specific columns and changing the connections between them. And over time, connections that generate useful patterns of activity will be selected for by evolution, and those that don't will be um, un uh, non-selected. Is that the word? Selected against. <laughs> Thank you. Will be selected against. So... So this gives us now, you can now ignore this little LSD here, we'll talk about that, that's a little clue, that's the first drug, there it is. So, so, um, so now we can kind of understand what's going on as your brain evolves, the connections change uh, and the ge brain generates more and more useful information. So now we can, we can again see this diagram with fresh eyes, we can see exactly what's going on. The information, the mutual information between the brain and the environment is increasing because the brain is sculpting itself. It's sculpting the connectivity between the columns. The columns stay the same, but the connectivity between them changes. So the patterns of information generated by them changes. So that means that now when you look out onto the world, you kind of intuitively think that the world, you're, you're seeing the world like a video camera. But it's not the case at all. Your brain builds this world and is happy to build this world without any help from sensory information. However, what sensory information does in a modern human brain is it kind of constrains it. So this is a pattern of information from the environment, right? It's not a cortical column, it's just a pattern of information from the environment. Uh, and this is the ongoing activity of the, the brain, of the cortical columns. And if patterns of information from the environment match this is called sensory matching, match patterns of information in the brain, then they will amplify those patterns of information in the brain. So the world that you've experienced isn't built from sensory information. All sensory information does is amplify and select on the ongoing activity, the ongoing information generation, selecting specific patterns of information over others. So this is why you live in a very stable, predictable world when you're awake. But it's got nothing to do uh, with your brain working like some sort of video camera and kind of just taking snapshots of the world. Your, your a perception, uh, experiencing world is a very active process. And your brain is building your world all the time. If you want a, a, a more kind of visual way of thinking about it, you can think about the, the connectivity of the brain, giving the brain a certain structure, uh, which in the same way, if you imagine a, the structure of a wine glass, uh, beautiful tulip wine glass, for example, has a certain structure, has a certain resonance. If you have a different wine glass, it rings slightly differently. If you get a, a good singer who can sing a pure note, you can get them to sing the right note and it will resonate. And it's the structure of the wine glasses will, will require a different note uh, to activate it. So in a way, you can think about the brain kind of tuning in uh, over the course of neuroevolution neuro, uh, neuro um, tuning in to uh, information from the environment uh, and kind of resonating. So some, for some people, this is a, an easier way to kind of imagine this. Uh, but this is the same thing. It's not a, entirely scientifically accurate. I don't like to regard the brain as a, a vibrating structure like this, but some people it helps to visualize it. Um, so your brain is very, very good at building your world. Uh, as, as far as science will admit, this world is the only world your brain knows how to build. Um, and when you are awake, your sensory information is merely constraining, as I said, constraining and modulating the uh, world building. But it's, it's, the world is never built from sensory information. However, 
briefly, this is how uh, sensory information modulates uh, the world building. So most of the world building kind of goes on uh, in these what are called association or higher areas of the cortex, but again, it's not too important. So this is where the information is generated that builds your world. Um, but the information actually comes, let's just talk about visual information first of all, uh, for simplicity, comes from the, uh, the front of the brain and is that via the retina of course, and is actually passed by this structure here, the thalamus, uh, to uh, what are called the, the primary sensory areas, uh, particularly the visual, uh, primary visual cortex. And then from there, that information is passed to um, these association areas, these higher areas, uh, and basically modulates and, and constrains the worlds that are being built by this part of the brain. Now, when you descend into sleep and you dream every night, you enter a world that is often indistinguishable from the normal waking world. And in fact, people have done studies looking at dreaming uh, and actually analyzed how long the proportion of time you spend talking on the telephone versus watching television, for example, in the dream state, compared to when waking, and they're very, very similar. Uh, this is called the continuity hypothesis of dreaming, which states that dreaming is continuous with waking. And indeed, dreaming is continuous with waking because the dream world is built using exactly the same information as your waking world. The difference is that when you start dreaming, these primary sensory areas that not receive information from the environment normally are shut down. Unfortunately, so are the frontal areas. These areas uh, are responsible for many of your critical functions. So if, um, if somebody in the room suddenly disappeared and was replaced by an alligator, we would we were pretty shocked by that. We'd think there's something strange going on here, right? <laughs> Most of you would. Um, but uh, I'm not so sure. But in the dream state, when that happens, it's like, ugh, whatever, yeah? Uh, uh, you lose that critical function because the, the, and you can learn to reactivate it, of course, and this is how lucid dreaming works. You can reactivate your frontal lobes, uh, your frontal cortices, and you can regain that critical function. You go, ah, that's, this is a fucking dream. Yeah, no, that's the kind of thing that goes on, right? Um, that's how it works. But anyway, so, yeah, so, you're, so when you're dreaming, your, world, your brain is building worlds from the same information that it does when you're, when you're awake. The only difference is that uh, the sensory information doesn't constrain these worlds. So the worlds can become a little bit stranger. Uh, they, can, they can shift. They, they become less stable, less predictable, kind of uh, often uh, more novel. But generally, the waking world is, is continuous with waking. So we can understand this now, why that's the case. OK, now. So what happens when you take a psychedelic drug? So let's imagine LSD. This could equally be uh, psilocybin. The, the neuropharmacology of this is a little bit complex, and I, I don't want to go into it simply because I don't want to alienate, alienate uh, any of my audience. <laughs> um, uh, and it would take too much time. But needless to say, so this is the normal waking state. We're familiar with this. And remember that this connectivity constraint uh, and, and regulates the kind of patterns of information that the brain can adopt. So you live in a very stable and predictable world. Fabulous. However, when LSD enters the brain, what you get is something that I like to call a democratization of cortical columns. So the brain is able to adopt states that it could never adopt um, under the, in the normal waking state. Kind of loosens the brain up. This strict control by this patterns of connectivity um, is, is loosened, which is why I've, I've shown this kind of these dotted lines here. And so the brain can, uh, can essentially start to um, develop novel patterns of information. And so your world goes from being stable, predictable, reliable, to being unstable, unpredictable, novel. Um, you get strange connections between uh, visual imagery, uh, connections between visual imagery and uh, auditory imagery, and um, many other strange effects. Uh, this can be explained entirely in terms of the way that uh, LSD, which of course itself is a pattern of information, uh, modulates and changes the way that the brain generates uh, information. Nice. Very, very nice. Um, so another way, and people often, when they take LSD, they often describe um, seeing the world as if, as if as a child, like seeing the world anew. And there's kind of an explanation for that because the, the evolved human brain is, is restricted, as I said, uh, and generates information that's very useful and is controlled by these patterns of connectivity. When you take a psychedelic, it's as if 
the control maintained by sensory information from the environment is removed. It doesn't mean the brain is unable to receive information from the environment. Often it can receive more. Uh, but it isn't so tightly controlled and regulating the types of information it can receive. And so all of this information here is, if you like, free information. Here you've got much less of that. This is much more constrained to the useful information that's important for surviving uh, and functioning in the world. So the psychedelic state is a much uh, freer, more novel state, but not necessarily as useful. You know, you wouldn't want to be tripping 24 hours a day, would you? <laughs> um, so it doesn't mean, again, doesn't mean the psychedelic state is, is inferior to the waking state at all. All worlds are built for information. All worlds are equally valid. All worlds are equally real. So don't let anyone ever tell you that these worlds are all you know, in your head and uh, distortions of reality. Uh, people often say this. You read this in old books that uh, psychedelics distort reality. No, 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 no. They change your world. They change your reality. But this reality is equally valid. It might not be as immediately useful for surviving in the world, you might not, for example, be able to distinguish uh, a predator from prey, and that could have uh, uh, dire consequences. A bear from a teddy bear, for example. <laughs> right? OK, good. So now we get onto DMT. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what DMT does, and then we'll have this little break. Uh, you can kind of integrate everything I've spoken about. So with DMT, something rather different happens. With other classic psychedelics, what seems to happen is, as I've said, the world goes from being stable and predictable to being unstable, unpredictable, and novel. But it's generally a version of this world. With DMT, something very different happens. You get this 100% reality switch, and the normal world disappears and is replaced by an entirely alien world. Uh, it's, it's as if the brain is no longer being constrained by information from this reality, but suddenly becomes constrained by information from another reality, which is why I've shown uh, not a looser set of connectivity, but almost like a different set of connectivities, like a parallel set. So we can think about it like this. With LSD, we kind of stopped here. The brain and the world become uh, less tightly uh, interwoven, less tightly connected. But with DMT, you get a complete severance of uh, the brain information and the world information. But it's as if the brain information is overlapping. It's starting to get mutual information between uh, the brain and a uh, world from uh, an alternate uh, reality, this, the DMT space, the, uh, this alien reality. Does that make sense? It will make more sense, hopefully, as we go on. So when you smoke DMT, normally what you do is you um, close your eyes and lie down. There's no point, particularly with a breakthrough dose, of trying to kind of navigate this world. Your brain actually loses the ability to sample information from this reality. So before we had this idea that information from the sensory information uh, is actually matched to uh, ongoing information. So here we can see this pattern of information is matched to this pattern of information already being generated by the brain. But when DMT enters the brain, you get a completely different pattern, uh, a completely different structure, uh, informational structure, if you like. Uh, and this pattern of information from the normal waking consensus world uh, no longer matches. So the brain actually loses the ability to sample information from this world. However, the way that the, um, the structure, if you like, of the brain changes it means that information from this alternate reality, this DMT world, suddenly matches. And here we can see this is information, pattern information, not from this world, but from this alternate reality, which is matched to this new ongoing information uh, and amplifies mm. it. So your brain literally starts interacting with another world. Again, for some people, uh, make this a little bit more visual and more clear. Again, before we had this idea that the connectivity of the brain creates a structure which makes the brain um, generate information in a certain pattern. Uh, and this resonates, if you like, with patterns of information from the environment. When you take DMT, this structure changes. The brain starts generating completely novel patterns of information such that there's no longer uh, any possibility for information to be transferred from the external world, the usual external world, uh, to uh, the brain. However, 
information from an alternative space. After the break, I will talk about what are the nature of this uh, kind of alien reality. Uh, but it basically, it's information that's being received now from this uh, alternate uh, universe, essentially. It's a pretty bold statement for a scientist to make, but anyway, whatever. So, <laughs> so now we have a kind of a, a fairly neat and complete understanding of, of what's going on here is during the normal waking state, your brain is receiving information from your consensus reality from the normal world that we're familiar with. Um, this is, forget about 5-HT, don't worry about that. When you um, smoke DMT or inject DMT, DMT floods the brain, it changes the information generation of the brain and sensory data, sensory information from this alien reality can be received. So this alien reality is not distant, it's not far away, it is, as Terence McKenna used to say, one quantum away, yeah? Raging, yeah, active intelligence, that kind of thing, right? So it's, yeah, so this D DMT reality is right there, um, but we have no access to it, simply because we cannot receive information from it. So now we also have the answer to the question, before I said, what does it mean to be transported to another world? Well, all it requires, all it requires is that your brain can receive information from that reality. If, you, if your brain can receive information from that reality, then you literally enter that reality. So here, this little bad boy, <laughs> you can see his pattern of information he's generating. This is the alien beast they've never met. And without DMT, they will indeed never meet. But he consumes some... DMT, and we know this changes the structure, changes the, the patterns of information generation, and suddenly <laughs> they can finally meet each other. And this is what people experience, of course, meeting, often reg regarded as very, very, very old friends uh, in the DMT space. Okay, so quick summary, then we'll have a break. So the brain is a complex pattern of information and an information generator. Your world is built, and all circumstances, all the time, from information generated uh, by your brain, but viewed from the subjective perspective. Psychedelic drugs, of course, including DMT, and you need everything, uh, uh, themselves patterns of information. When a psychedelic drug enters your brain, it interacts with the brain's information and changes it. So it changes your world. Sometimes this can be subtle, with a low dose of psilocybin, for example. Sometimes this can be so profound that your uh, reality literally switches. So, having said that, let's have a break for 10 minutes uh, and then we'll get to the next part. Where were we? Um, so I guess it would be uh, perhaps a good idea just to kind of recap where we are before we move on. So, so in the first half, I kind of started by talking about the, the fundamental structure of, of, of reality. You can't really go any deeper than that. And the idea that the world is fundamentally at its core, built from information and that this information processing, according to perhaps a very, very simple rule set, em uh, gives rise to emergent hierarchies of increasing, increasing complexity from the ground of reality itself through to fundamental particles, atoms, molecules, cells, all the way up to conscious humans uh, with brains. But that we mustn't lose sight of the fact, no matter how complex the world might appear, no matter how complex we might appear, that it's fundamentally, it's all information processing. And once we think of the world in that way, we see 
that psychedelics can be explained as not as distorters of reality, but as patterns of information themselves that change the information generated by your brain. The information generated by your brain is your world, and this is always the case whether you are awake, dreaming, or at the peak of uh, a psychedelic experience. Psychedelics change the information. They don't create a distortion of reality, they create a modified reality that is just as real. It might not be as adaptive, might not be as useful immediately uh, in terms of survival in the, in the natural world, but uh, it is a valid reality, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So, what I want to do now, I mean, I've, I've, I've spoken about this idea that DMT is special in that it causes 100% reality switch, as Terence McKenna used to call it. Um, and this idea that when DMT enters the brain, DMT changes the information of the brain such that the brain can no longer receive information from this reality, but receives information from an alternate reality, which we all, those of us that have used DMT, uh, experiences the DMT space, this highly complex world uh, replete with extremely intelligent creatures. But I haven't really spoken about the nature of this reality and why DMT might afford access, gate access to this reality um, specifically. So the first 15 minutes of the second part, before I go on to the extended DMT stuff that I did with Rick Strassman, uh, I want to get into actually thinking about what it means, how DMT can actually uh, allow you to access an altered reality. This, I will warn you, this, I, I, I wrestled with, with myself about whether or not to include this because it, it's a little bit trickier. You have to really think a little bit, uh, but you're all very, very smart people so far. The responses, everyone seems to be very, have a good understanding of what I've said, so hopefully I've been reasonably cogent. Um, uh, in my presentation so far, so I'm, I'm happy to go ahead with this. So, we used, at the very beginning of my talk, I used Conway's Game of Life, this two-dimensional cellular automaton, as a model of reality. Now, of course, no one's suggesting that reality is Conway's Game of Life, but that reality works in a similar kind of way, and that you have a very, very simple rule set, the base of reality, uh, space and time, uh, broken, up, bro broken up into discrete units, time marching along uh, one step at a time, uh, and space broken up into uh, individual cells, which are obviously not two-dimensional, right? There are at least three dimensions of space that we know of, so we can't use Conway's game of life, but we can extend Conway's game of life into uh, a three-dimensional cellular automaton. And that works in the same way, except you have to um, consider uh, cells in, an, in a three-dimensional neighborhood. You have to consider, consider cells up, above and below. So it requires information to be transferred uh, from the third dimension. So let me give you some examples. So let's imagine now not one single cellular automaton, one single two-dimensional cellular automaton like the, the game of life. But let's imagine we've got a stack of three of them, or four or five, doesn't matter. We've got a stack of these cellular automata. Each one, of course, uh, forms these patterns of information that we've discussed in great detail. So when we bring these together to form this stack, I now ask you the question, is this a stack of 2D cellular automata, or is it now a three-dimensional cellular automaton? Both, possibly, right? It it's kind of is both. But actually, the answer is not so simple. To answer that question, you need to answer another question, which is, is information transmitted between cellular automata? If the answer to that question is no, then it is a stack of 2D cellular automata. If we use Conway's game of life and imagine that each cellular automaton is indeed using the physics of their universe is Conway's game of life rules, those four simple rules, this will always be a stack of 2D cellular automata. Why? Because Conway's rules do not take into account cells above and below, what we call cells in the orthogonal direction. So they only take account of cells in your 
in the same plane in which you are. Which means that any critters, any beings that emerge on a cellular automaton like Conway's game of life will never ever know that they're part of this higher dimensional system. Why? Simply because information cannot be received from this orthogonal dimension from the third dimension. However, this, for reasons which I'll explain in a second, is also three 2D cellular automata. When you bring these together, this becomes a three-dimensional cellular automaton. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the rules are slightly different. So this cellular automaton, instead of having just two states, so instead of each cell being either alive or dead, black or white, whatever, you actually have three states. So a cell, in this case, the three states are white, black, and blue. The colors are completely arbitrary and irrelevant, but you just have to remember that you've got three distinct states. And each state, as we learned with Conway's Game of Life, uh, whether it the, remains in that state or changes to another state depends on a rule. So if, uh, in Conway's Game of Life, for example, if a cell is alive and it has less than one neighbor, uh, it will die of loneliness. If a cell is dead and it's got exactly three neighbors, uh, it will uh, become alive, otherwise it will remain dead. So let's imagine, now of course Conway's Game of Life, the rules that dictate Conway's game of life are just one set of rules again, amongst a, a large number. Conway, John Conway didn't kind of invent the game of life so much as discover it. There are a, a very, very large number of possible rules that you could make up. And you can make them up, you can run them on a computer, very, very simple. Many, many, many have been studied. But only a handful actually produce complex if, uh, behavior like Conway's game of life. So let's imagine different types of rules. So let's imagine uh, with the black and white states of our new cellular automaton, they only have a 2D neighborhood. What that means is that when a cell updates its state, it's only looking at cells in its own uh, plane. It doesn't take into account cells uh, up and down, which means that it's not receiving information from the orthogonal, the third dimension. So any creature built from black and white states, a pattern, any pattern of information built from black and white states will never ever know that it is a part of a three-dimensional structure because the rules don't allow it. However, our new state, the blue state, is different. Its rules do take into account the third dimension. So whether a, a blue cell remains blue or changes to white or changes to black will depend on not only the states of the cells in the two-dimensional neighborhood but also will depend on the states up and down. So they will, do, they will also have an effect on the update. What that means is that the blue state receives information from the third dimension. So Let's have a look at an extended version of this. So here we have our familiar cellular automaton. Uh, we have little, some creatures we're perhaps familiar with. We can see the, uh, the glider there. But this glider is never going to be aware, even if he was conscious, that he was part of a three-dimensional system, even when we have a stack of them. However, this blue structure is different. This blue structure is built from blue states, which means that... <coughs> It's actually part of a three-dimensional structure, simply by virtue of the fact that it receives information from the third dimension. So actually, this, whilst we see this blue structure here in the 2D cellular automaton, it's actually more accurate to regard this as a three-dimensional structure. So what that means is that if this, uh, this structure was actually highly complex and conscious, uh, it would actually experience a 3D world Whereas all of the beings uh, that are made from purely black and white states would only experience a two-dimensional world. Now, what's interesting about cellular automata is that the distribution of states, the, the, whether or not certain states are common or extremely rare, depends upon the patterns of activation that are being generated by the cellular automaton. So what that means is that uh, certain patterns of information will mean that blue states are extremely rare, perhaps non-existent. 
But when you change the information, you can tweak the cellular automaton, perhaps by pro providing an input of information, uh, and you can actually cause blue states to emerge. And if this happens in a brain, you change the information of the brain such that uh, states that, uh, if you imagine a brain that is built purely from states, uh, not necessarily a brain, let's call it a brain complex, something that emerges on a 2D plane. If it's built purely from black and white states, it will always be um, within this 2D world. But if you tweak that information such that the brain information, the information the brain generates changes, it could cause the emergence of these uh, blue states, which in our model are states that can uh, interact with the higher dimension. So embedded within this two-dimensional world, you can actually have three-dimensional structures. And if these are conscious, then this three-dimensional structure will experience the three-dimensional world, and all of these other structures will only experience the two-dimensional world. And this structure will perhaps say to these other structures that it entered this very, very strange reality, uh, where it could see um, both sides of, of an object at once. Uh, it seemed to have more dimensions, uh, more than the two dimensions. And of course, they wouldn't, believe, they wouldn't believe him. But it would be the case. Because this being here, the same structure built from, purely from black cells is a two-dimensional structure, lives in a two-dimensional world. However, by changing the information, you can cause the emergence of blue cells within the structure, which means it suddenly, and perhaps temporarily, starts experiencing an orthogonal reality. So if we extend this then to our world, we know that our brain is this extremely complex information generating machine. When you perturb that information generation, you change, modify that information generation by DMT, for example, what it does is it causes the brain to suddenly be able to re uh, receive information from what we would call an orthogonal dimension, so beyond the normal uh, three dimensions. Um, so this is kind of to summarize. I apologize, this is quite complex and difficult to grasp. Uh, uh, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast, I'm afraid. So we think of our reality uh, in the same way that a creature on a 2D cellular automaton would uh, see its uh, reality as being a purely two-dimensional reality, actually it's embedded, it's actually a slice, a two-dimensional slice of a uh, higher dimensional structure. So we can think of our reality as being a lower dimensional slice, perhaps a three-dimensional slice of a much higher uh, dimensional structure. We might call this hyperspace. So DMT changes the information of the brain, such as information from this orthogonal dimension can be received, albeit temporarily. So what actually happens, your brain quite literally becomes a high dimensional information processor. It's receiving information from these higher dimensions. Uh, and you literally become part of this high dimensional reality, albeit again temporarily. Now, if this is true, you would expect this reality to have, to have certain properties. Since these much higher dimensional spaces have a much greater capacity for greater complexification, as we said earlier, everything is a manifestation of the, uh, the complexification of information, we should expect to see extreme complexity, hyper-intelligent entities, uh, and apparent impossibility. You would be viewing uh, a higher dimensional reality. You would meet higher dimensional beings of inordinate intelligence, way beyond anything that's even possible in this reality, uh, and you would also meet impossible objects. Dennis McKenna talks about elves singing impossible objects into existence. People often describe uh, seeing all sides uh, of an object at once, uh, of, of being tossed um, through hyperspace, high dimensional objects, what are often described as eight, nine dimensional objects. This can be explained if we think about uh, DMT's effects in this way, not just in changing the information of the brain, but changing it uh, 
such that the brain actually uh, is able to re start receiving information from this orthogonal dimension, which is right here, it's right there. In the same way that a 2D cellular automaton, the, the beings on this 2D automaton don't know it, but they are, they are embedded in this uh, bizarre three-dimensional reality. In the same way, we are literally embedded as a three-dimensional slice of this higher-dimensional alien reality, and it only takes a tweak of the brain uh, with DMT uh, to access it. So, so let's move on a little bit now <coughs> into some of the practicalities of, of DMT use. As, as, uh, uh, as Daniel spoke about at the beginning, I became very interested in DMT as this gateway to this universe, uh, but also frustrated. Um, people often get wedded to the idea, this romantic idea of sitting on a, a hand-woven rug and raising this uh, uh, hand-blown glass pipe to the lips and smoking DMT after doing you know, meditation and stuff, all wonderful stuff. But I think we should use our technological apparatus to access these realms for longer periods of time. I think we owe it. You know, you, we're dealing with perhaps extremely intelligent, powerful beings. The best that we can do when we enter their realm uh, is to use our best tools, to bring our best tools to the table. So I'm not saying that traditional uh, preparations of DMT like ayahuasca uh, or vaporized DMT from a pipe is, is inferior to the, the method that I'm going to describe. But I think uh, we need to use the technology that we have because, of course, DMT is very short-acting. Uh, and this pretty much encapsulates the usual mode of ingestion. So you smoke or vaporize the DMT in this little glass pipe, and you're uh, hurtled into this space for three, four, five, six minutes and then you're kind of dragged back. By the time you can get your bearings, uh, it's all over. So let's talk about what actually happens when you, when you smoke DMT from a much more physiological sense. So we'll go away from the sort of the brain and the information stuff and actually think, well, what's actually happening? So you, you take DMT, uh, it goes into the brain uh, through whatever mode of administration you, uh, you choose. You might choose to smoke it, that's by far the most uh, common mode of administration, or you might choose to inject it. Uh, but either way, it enters the brain, and immediately it starts to be metabolized, it starts to be broken down, uh, and it starts to be eliminated. And this happens very, very rapidly with DMT. However, DMT does have some properties um, that other classic psychedelics don't. And one of this is a lack of tolerance. So LSD and psilocybin, whilst... They, the onset is much slower, generally, unless you inject it, uh, and the plateau is much longer. You can stay there a lot longer. Uh, however, a second dose will generally, although this is actually disputed by uh, recent experiments, but generally people tend to experience a much uh, reduced effect on subsequent doses. But with DMT, um, Rick Strassman, when he did his uh, study in the 90s, he actually spent uh, some time giving people repeated doses of DMT. So you, you would inject them, he would observe the effect, they would fill out his hallucin, hallucinogen rating score, um, then he would inject them again 30 minutes later, and they'd fill it out again, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, up to kind of five or six times, and he would find that actually the subjective effects uh, would be the, the same each time, showing that DMT doesn't have this subjective tolerance effects of other, other psychedelics. <coughs> So, so DMT is kind of special. It ha it's extremely rapidly acting, extremely non-toxic, uh, but it also doesn't have uh, this, this tolerance effect. So this suggested to me that we could actually use the same technology that anesthetists, anesthesiologists, I think you call them over here, use to maintain uh, stable brain concentrations of anesthetics. You go into... Uh, the, the theater, to have an operation. The anesthesiologist, they won't just inject you with the anesthetic, but they will um, 
They will give you an infusion, a constant infusion at a precisely calculated rate in order to maintain the level of uh, anesthetic in your brain, which is, of course, where the anesthetic is acting, like DMT, at a constant level. And they can actually push you slightly deeper. They're going to, during the incision, for example, where there's a lot of pain receptors, uh, they will do a, uh, push you slightly deeper into your uh, uh, anesthetized state. And to avoid toxicity, they can also bring you, bring you out, bring you to a lower state. So it can actually regulate the amount of drug in your brain quite precisely. And there's a whole science about the whole kind of mathematical modeling um, science um, designed to achieve exactly this. So I thought, well, why can't we do this with, with DMT? There's no tolerance. It's fast acting, just like other anesthetics. So why can't we do it with DMT? So, so this is basically the setup for target control intravenous infusion. What you have when you inject a drug, a number of things are happening. So you, you inject the drug into a vein and it immediately enters what's known as the central compartment. So this is basically uh, your blood vessels, your large blood vessels. From the central compartment, it then travels to the all-important effect compartment. This is the brain. And this is where we want to control the level of DMT. You also have to consider, unfortunately, especially with an infusion, uh, is that the, bra uh, the drug also goes into small blood vessels, very small, fine blood vessels, that aren't rooted to the brain. Uh, we call this the second compartment. And also, particularly with long infusions, uh, the drug can equilibrate with fatty tissue as well. And you need to take account uh, all of these um, when you're de designing a target-controlled int uh, intravenous infusion protocol. And you can do it mathematically. So you'll notice there are little arrows. So these show the direction, the movement of the drug. And then there are these little numbers, K1, <coughs> E, K1, 3. Don't worry about those. They are rates. They are numbers that define how quickly the drug moves into the third compartment, out of the third compartment, etc., etc. The rate of elimination and basically removal from the body. And all of this uh, is amenable to mathematical modeling. So this gave me the confidence that I could use this type of mathematical model um, to develop a model for DMT rather than for anesthetics. So first of all, a few checks, checks and balances. Uh, drugs that are suitable for target controlled intravenous infusion that are used in anesthesiology have to have a number of properties. They have to have a rapid onset of clinical effects. Um, you don't want drugs taking a long time to take effect. Um, short duration of action. Um, low behavioral pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic tolerance. That basically means the drug has the same effect with repeated administration and a favorable side effect profile. You don't want a drug that leads to uh, toxic side effects. Fortunately, DMT passes the test uh, and exhibits all of these properties. So the basic idea of target controlled infusion is that you inject the drug and it slowly or quite rapidly in the case of DMT enters the effect site, which is the brain. Uh, and then you hold it there with a continuous infusion, and then uh, when you want to bring someone out of the DMT space, you simply stop the infusion, and they will come back out. And the distance here, the, the, the length of time this could be uh, achieved for is, is undetermined. Hours, days, weeks, months. Um, <laughs> Obviously, when you get to longer periods of time, you have to think about other things. You need to talk about waste management, right? Um, so things get more complicated when you get into more than a day. So that's, that's possible. So the first thing, when I first talk about this, the, the response I always get is this. Haven't you heard of ayahuasca? Uh, normally, people don't even read the paper in which we actually discuss ayahuasca at length, uh, some length. Um, but DMT is, pure DMT is not ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a mixture of drugs. Uh, DMT is certainly the most important drug in that decoction, but there are other drugs which can have a psychedelic, uh, or at least psychoactive effect as well. But also, ayahuasca does not allow you, it does allow you extended trips in DMT space, but it does not allow you to ma manage and carefully control a, uh, a specific brain concentration. So it, this, it's, 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 it's a wonderful technology, 
And you think about you know, the invention of that, the discovery of that technology by the indigenous people in Amazonia, it's remarkable, uh, but it's very different to what we're proposing. Also, ayahuasca is accompanied by numerous unpleasant side effects, uh, both end purging, violent purging, you know, it's, 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 it's not particularly, it's a very humbling experience, uh, but not something you'd want to do in a, on a hospital bed. Also, and perhaps most importantly here, uh, when you look at the peak DMT blood con concentration after consuming ayahuasca, forget about the, the units here, 15 to 18 nanograms per milliliter. Whereas with, um, this is uh, Rick Strassman's higher dose, 0.4 milligrams per kilogram uh, intravenous injection, you, you reach levels of over 100. So this is a different level. So we're not, uh, we're not uh, suggesting that we bring someone to this level. We're, we're suggesting we not only reach this level, but actually maintain this level. <clears throat> so I had this idea. So I was satisfied now that it, it could work. So what I needed then was, was blood data. When you develop a pharmacokinetic model, you need pharmacokinetic data. You need blood data. You need to inject lots of people with DMT, and you need to record their blood DMT concentration uh, over time. Fortunately, Rick Strassman did that, so I dropped Rick an email, and literally 30 minutes later, I got back this uh, package of Excel files, which I had to kind of decipher. It was, it was all pretty messy, but the data was all there. So what that means, then, is that we can plot, the, this is for an average person, uh, we can plot the DMT concentration, so this is after 0.4 milli, this is the highest dose uh, that Rick used. Uh, you can see the red dots here. This is the blood DMT concentration over time. So it, uh, after, it's measured after two minutes, uh, and it's about sort of 55 nanograms per milliliter, then it drops uh, over subsequent minutes and goes basically back to baseline after about an hour. So although, so this, ha having uh, uh, got this blood sample data from Rick Strassman, this can then be used for developing this mathematical model. You remember, um, I showed you this diagram, which had all these numbers in. This is based, the basis for this mathematical model. And the idea is you fit your, you fit your mathematical model to replicate the... Uh, actual data in humans. So then you know, you have an idea then of how quickly DMT passes between these different compartments. It's, it's quite clever really. Uh, just by measuring the blood concentration, you get an idea, you can, by fitting your uh, blood data to this mathematical model, you get an idea of how quickly DMT is moving from uh, the central compartment from the blood to the brain, for example. And you can control for that. So this is the fitted curve. As you can see, the peak is actually before uh, Rick took his first blood sample, and it peaks at over 100 nanograms per milliliter, so six or seven times higher than is achieved with uh, a regular dose of ayahuasca. So then we can actually expand this and get a probably the most uh, clearly defined time course of a DMT trip that's, that's been produced, I dare say, uh, and basically records what's happening to DMT in the brain during a normal, what's called a bolus injection. So all of the DMT is injected, uh, not all at once, but over sort of 30 seconds, so pretty quickly, uh, which is what uh, Rick Strassman used in the study. So you get an initial bolus of 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of DMT over about 30 seconds, and you see the DMT rises rather rapidly, and at about a minute, uh, you, you seem to cross this threshold which is about 60 nanograms per milliliter of DMT in the brain itself. And this is when the subject enters the DMT space. Uh, and they remain in that DMT space as long as the brain DMT concentration remains above 60 uh, nanograms per milliliter. So the uh, brain concentration continues to rise up to about 100 and it reaches a peak after about three minutes. This is the peak of your DMT trip after about three minutes. Then it begins to decline. You might not notice the decline um, whilst you're in that space, but you will notice when you exit the space 
uh, which is when the blood DMT, sorry, the brain DMT concentration again drops below this 60 nanograms per milliliter threshold, and this is when you exit the DMT space. Uh, and this, this pattern seems to follow uh, what Rick saw uh, in terms of these subjective reports, when people seem to enter the space, when they seem to uh, exit the space. So we, we, we were kind of confident by this point that the model was uh, reasonably accurate and that it uh, accurately, reasonably accurately replicated what we actually see in, in humans. So that allows us then to move on to developing the continuous intravenous protocol. So this was a simple bolus injection. So the simplest protocol which we went for uh, initially is what's known as the bolus elimination transfer protocol. Again, the name of that is important, but it's, it's a, a common mode uh, protocol used in anesthesiology. And the idea is you give someone an initial injection of the drug, the bolus, uh, to bring the level of DMT in the brain to the desired level. Now, as I said before, once the level peaks in the brain, uh, it immediately starts declining. So what you want to do is to compensate for the decline by the infusion. So you bring it to the right level, and then as soon as it starts declining, you start infusing and keep it at that level. Now, you have to be very careful, of course. If you infuse too fast, the level continues to increase. Then you send someone into you know, spaces they don't want to be. Um, and if it's too slow, they still come out of the space, but, but more slowly. So getting it level is quite tricky. So, so this is the second phase. The initial bolus brings the DMT to the desired level. Then, so in, in, in our protocol, this was 25 milligrams of DMT infused over 30 seconds. And then you use the continuous infusion of DMT at a rate to compensate for the loss of the drug from the brain by metabolism and elimination. Uh, and in our protocol, we begin infusion at two minutes at a rate of 4.2 milligrams per, uh, per minute. And again, the details here aren't important. It's the principle. So let's have a look what happens in the model. This has yet to be tested in humans. Uh, is we can see the plasma concentration. Uh, so this is just the concentration in the blood that you would normally measure, um, and the concentration in the brain. So you get this initial spike, very high spike, DMT in the plasma. But concentration in the blood does not mean concentration in the brain. So you never reach 200 uh, nanograms per milliliter in the brain. Actually, what happens, you can see we start the infusion here, uh, just as it's declining. So just as the level is reaching about 110 uh, in, uh, nanograms per milliliter in the plasma, we begin the infusion. Uh, and you can actually see that the level in the, uh, the effect site in the brain increases rather smoothly. So you get a nice smooth entry into the DMT space. And everyone prefers a smooth entry to a rough one. Um, and then we begin the infusion, and it kind of levels out at around 100 nanograms per milliliter. So this person will be in, in, in a full breakthrough uh, experience. Um, so that's really pretty much all I've got to say about this extended state work. I think Daniel's going to talk uh, more about actually implementing this in humans. We, when I kind of developed this, I didn't expect the interest that I got from it, to be honest. Well, I kind of half did. But you know, I still receive emails from people saying, you know, I've never done any psychedelic drugs, but can I, can I volunteer <laughs> for your protocol? You know, you know, well, I, smoked, I, I smoked grass at, in college. You know, um, can, I, can I join your protocol? You know, so I have to say that we're not recruiting at the moment. Um, so that happened a lot. You know, so I wasn't really expecting people to kind of pick up the mantle and say, actually, uh, this is, we're actually going to do this. Uh, so this is where kind of Daniel comes in. Uh, so in my opinion, um, when we wrote the paper, we, we kind of had to frame it in kind of a slightly kind of psych psychotherapeutic terms. So we didn't say we want to, and we published in an, you know, quite a mainstream academic journal. Uh, initially, we, we decided you know, we wouldn't talk about alien worlds, you know, and that kind of thing. In meeting, you know, establishing communication, you know, with hyperspace, that kind of thing. Uh, so we, we kind of framed it in terms of therapeutic uses. And indeed, it might be true that at low doses, by maintaining someone in a sub-threshold, sub-breakthrough state, uh, might be very, very useful uh, for psychothera psychotherapeutic purposes. But really, uh, for me personally, it was all about gaining access, stable, extended access uh, to this DMT space uh, and... 
perhaps establishing extended communication with uh, intelligent beings f not of this universe. You know, and if that was ever achieved, uh, it would be you know, the greatest discovery in the history of mankind, I think. Um, so, but anyway, I'll finish with E.E. E. Cummings. Listen, there's a hell of a universe next door. Let's go. Thank you very much.